This is Dr. Debbie Morris at the Methodist University PA program, and I am recording this presentation to help newer faculty members learn how to write effective exam questions. This is just a primer. It's a very um, kind of short and superficial overview, but I would like you to think about it and then learn more about writing questions because questions in exams are how we assess our students' ability, um, how we assess their knowledge and their competence, and it's important that they be effective so that we can do those things. So why do we test? We test for a number of reasons. Obviously, the, uh, the main one is to assess the knowledge that the student has gained from the course that we're teaching. We also need to distinguish between the students who have grasped the material and who understand it well enough to proceed in the program and students who don't, who need either some remediation or additional teaching in order to assure that they have a clear understanding um, and, and sometimes to identify students who are just simply not able to continue with the program because they are unable to grasp enough of the knowledge to achieve um, competence. We also have students who are going to have to take in a very short time, two, two, just over two years, a high stake certification exam, an exam that costs a good deal of money and that if not passed um, means that they won't be able to get a job until it is passed and we'll have to put up more money. So we are thinking ahead in terms of providing our students with some practice in the kinds of assessment that are going to be used to determine if they are um, know enough to become a PA. And then a little bit less obvious, student performance on exams that we give can help us assess whether our teaching is effective or not. And in a future presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how we can do that, what statistics might be helpful. Some of this uh, material today is focused on how we do things here at the Methodist University PA program, but honestly, most of it is fairly universal, and it, the skills that you get when while teaching here will stand you in good stead if you end up teaching somewhere else. Um, there are other ways of testing than written tests, and we use a lot of them. You know, we do quizzes uh, that are kind of short exams. Um, it, we ask students to write sometimes. We um, do practical exams, and that's particularly in courses like anatomy and history and physical exams. But a lot of how we assess our students is through what we call multiple choice questions, um, abbreviated as MCQs. I want to talk primarily in this presentation about multiple choice questions. The best and simplest multiple choice questions have one best answer. There's actually a fair amount of research that has um, helped teachers move on from some of the forms of test question writing that were used in the past because research shows that they are less effective. So multiple choice questions should have one best answer. And that um, research has been applied to most certification exams. So things like the PANTS, the PA, a national certification exam, but also the National Board of Medical Examiner um, exams. Um, are aware that that is the best way 
to um, approach written testing. And it provides a lot of flexibility. We tend to think of these questions as being too simple and only testing uh, facts, but in fact, they can be used to assess the ability to analyze information, the ability to draw conclusions, the ability to apply knowledge. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in this presentation. And I will give you some resources to help you go more deeply if you are interested. I think of these general principles, the single most important one is that you need to be assessing what you are teaching, that your questions need to be aligned with the material that you teach, which should be reflected in your lecture objectives and course outcomes. In a perfect world, we would map all of our syllabi with the course outcomes and lecture objectives to the test questions that we eventually write and administer to our students so that we could show how they connect across um, the course from the beginning through the actual teaching and finally to the assessment. As you're writing an exam, you need to balance the exam across the material that you've taught. If you are testing on the past five lectures, it would be important that there were approximately the same number of questions from the material in each lecture. At the beginning of our curriculum, um, we use a lot of facts based questions. For instance, in anatomy, we're going to be asking some uh, questions that are based on memorizing material. But the best questions it allow us to assess the student's ability not just to know the facts, but to apply them, um, to analyze clinical material, and particularly as the curriculum develops in their learning clinical medicine to solve problems, to apply their critical thinking skills. So questions in some of the basic science courses may be more fact-based. Questions in some of the later courses um, have to be more um, focused on analysis and problem solving. I have a few pointers that are fairly specific to Methodist. We have determined that um, most of our exams should have between 50 and 75 questions. 60 is a good number. Sometimes on the final exam, you might want a few more. Um, Remembering that in any course, we should be assessing the students in more than one way. So you don't want to have a course where you base the final grade only on multiple choice uh, written examinations. There are other ways to assess and they are important and we will talk about those again in a different presentation. But in our written exams, one of the things that we want to be careful about is that our students are incentivized to retain knowledge as they proceed in the curriculum. So in terms of a given course, we don't want our students studying lectures one through four, cramming, memorizing, and then studying lectures uh, five through nine um, and forgetting everything in lectures one to four. So we ask that you be very clear that your final exam will be comprehensive, meaning that while you may be testing primarily the second half of the course or the last third of the course, you are also going to include material that they were previously tested on and that was included earlier in the course. 
um, and teach our students as, as graduate students should know, but sometimes have to learn, that this isn't about simply learning and testing for the grade, but it that it's about building a knowledge base that will stand them in good stead for the rest of their career. So let's get down to constructing a multiple choice question. You've all seen them. There's a paragraph with a question. And in medical education, that paragraph is often a clinical vignette. That question part is called a lead-in. And the lead-in, whether it's a vignette or something simpler, um, gives the information that is required, after which there's a question. And the question should be asked as a question with a question mark at the end of it uh, to assess the test taker's knowledge. When you are constructing a good multiple choice question, there are there is one clearly best answer, and there are three to four incorrect answers, which are sometimes called distractors. Just so you know, and because I might end up using the word, multiple choice questions and actually test questions in general are sometimes referred to as items. As I said before, these um, questions can have a lot of variation. And earlier in the curriculum and in basic science courses, there might not be a lot of lead in when we're simply assessing factual knowledge or even understanding of the knowledge. But it, it, extremely importantly, as the students progress, we need to start adding clinical cases or vignettes, making sure that the students have an opportunity to assess the information, analyze the information, and find the best answer to the question. So we are more interested, especially as the students have, are developing their uh, clinical knowledge, that they can analyze and that they can apply. This is something that I had never heard of really until I started teaching. It is a model of um, the development of knowledge and how we assess a student's development of knowledge. And it's called Bloom's Taxonomy. There are other uh, taxonomies, there are other ways of looking at this, but, but Bloom's has been around for a while and is widely understood and used. At the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy is knowledge and the ability to remember that knowledge. And as I said, in some of the earlier courses in the curriculum, that's what we're aiming for. We're giving them um, knowledge that they have to remember, which is providing a foundation for the other skills that they're going to develop. Understanding is taking that knowledge and, and really not just memorizing it, but understanding it, being able to explain it, to describe it. Above that, we start to get to those um, skills that are more important as a student develops their um, clinical knowledge, that they can apply the knowledge that they remember and understand, that they can analyze material and use their knowledge and understanding, that they can evaluate and ultimately create. Now, in multiple choice questions, we kind of get stopped around analyze. Uh, we can't really ask a student to create. To create and even to evaluate requires perhaps um, writing 
of a kind or spoken word assessment of a kind that we're not doing in a multiple choice exam. Um, but the more that we think about helping the students to learn how to analyze and apply knowledge, the, the better we are um, preparing them for their careers as PAs. So again, even in a course on uh, cardiology, um, even in a, a clinical course in internal medicine, some of what the students are going to be tested on is going to be lower in the taxonomy, um, like understanding, but more and more should be on applying and analyzing. So let's talk about how we do that. If we create a case vignette, we're providing background for the question that we're going to ask. Here, I have a very simple case vignette. An eight-year-old presents to urgent care, complaining of two days of sore throat and fever, and today has a faint maculopapular rash. Now, I could put a whole lot more information in there. I could put, um, you know, the child's name, I could say boy or girl, black or white. I could say they're uh, 15 kilograms. I could um, say something about their social situation, that they live with their parents or attend public school. But for the question that I'm going to ask in a minute, none of that is important. I will say that in many questions, the setting is important because the actions that you take would be different um, depending on the setting. For instance, if you saw somebody with a, a severe headache in a primary care office, say a thunderclap headache, um, the next step, if you asked a question, what is the best next step, would probably be to call 911, whereas if they were in the emergency room, it would be to stabilize their vital signs and get uh, an appropriate imaging test. So the setting's important and you, you will often include the setting. But other than that, include factors that are relevant, don't include factors that aren't relevant. A long list of medications and allergies, if they aren't important to the question that you're asking, probably don't belong there. So here I've expanded it. I say an eight-year-old presents complaining of two days of sore throat and fever and today has a faint maculopapular rash. Which of the following te lab tests is most important to perform? I asked that as a question. I didn't say the lab test to order is. That's just a little bit more confusing. I want to be very clear what I'm asking. And if I read that vignette and that question, I know the answer. I haven't seen the choices. The answer is a rapid strep test. So you should be able to answer the question before you see the choices. I want to talk just a little bit about question types. A lot of us... Um, default to writing true-false questions, but they're not very helpful in assessing knowledge. If you give a student who has uh, studied a little bit a true-false exam, they're going to do better than 50%, but even if they got a 70% and passed, they could do that on, on chance uh, pretty easily as long as they they got, um, of, of 50 questions, they got um, half of 40 of them right by guessing and maybe two-thirds of the 10, right? So they're going to pass without really knowing very much at all. Um, it's possible to use questions that have more than one correct answer, but among other things, they've been shown not to be as effective in assessing knowledge. They tend to be confusing. And you, you have to be very clear in the question that there's more than one correct answer. 
and you have to make some decisions like, is the student going to get credit if they answer one of the three correct answers? Are they going to get partial credit or do they need to answer it all correctly to get credit? I think it's better to just skip that kind of question. So let's go to the answers. There should be one correct answer. The other choices, there should be three to four uh, additional choices. So you want four or five choices. That's the sweet spot to make the question um, unlikely to be uh, answered correctly by chance, but not so complex that it starts really kind of muddying the water and doesn't help to discriminate. So four to five answer choices, A to D or A to E. The incorrect answers, which are sometimes called distractors, should be plausible. Um, they should be, if, if you're asking about a lab test, uh, you should include perhaps, since the case sounds like an infectious disease case, other lab tests for infectious diseases, as opposed to um, uh, tests for, I, I don't know, for, um, I mean, I guess it could be an autoimmune disease, but it's not likely. You just want to keep those um, uh, say troponin. You're not going to put troponin as the lab test because it's just not going to be plausible. You want the um, answer choices to be of relatively similar length. Um, so particularly avoiding having the correct answer have more detail and be longer because that gives a cue and we'll talk about that in a minute. So here I have some answer choices and I have these choices, CBC strep test monospot. My answer D is that no lab testing is indicated. I didn't say none of the above. And the reason for that is that no lab testing is indicated is very specific, right? None of the above is sort of general and it is not very good at helping, again, to distinguish students' um, knowledge. So all of the aboves and none of the aboves um, are not best answers. And ideally, we have one best answer. So try to stay away from all of the above and none of the above um, answers either as the correct answer um, or as a distractor. If you use it as a distractor, then you really only have three an uh, answer choices, which isn't ideal for, for um, distinguishing um, whether students have that knowledge or not. And they are just not as effective. So again, Try not to have your correct answer be longer than the distractors or more detailed than the distractors because that provides a cue to the student that that's probably the correct answer. Make sure that all of your alternate answers make sense. Um, try to be careful that they match the uh, tense and the singular plural status of the question that you asked. For instance, if you if your um, question asks about the best lab tests and then you have one option that has three tests, one option that has two tests, one option two options that have one test, it's obviously not the options with one test, right? So you want to make sure that it all makes sense and that it all fits together. When lots of us were in school, it was very common for test questions to be what were called multiple multiple choice or K-type, and they would have answer choices like A and B or A and D or A and B and C. Um, and 
again, research has demonstrated that these questions are not very effective in discriminating. Um, it was in vogue. It is out of vogue. It is not best practice. They won't encounter those on the certifying exam, so don't write them. It's just, um, even though that may be what you're used to, it's not going to be your um, best way of assessing your student's knowledge. And finally, don't try to be clever or tricky. Don't try to trick the students. We're not here to trick the students. We are here to assess the students um, and be fair. Sometimes your vignette is great and there are a lot of things that you wanna know about how that uh, student will approach the year old child with the fever and the sore throat and the rash. And so you could ask a question like, which of the following medications is most appropriate if the lab test is positive? Here we have answers, and you will notice that the answers are generic drugs and that I included the trade name um, in parentheses. You always need the generic. Uh, if you include the trade name, um, that is in addition to the generic name. Now, there are some things about this that aren't perfect, and I want to talk about that. Sometimes we use, um, people write a series of questions based on the same case. And that's okay, you can reuse the vignette. But I'm going to say a couple things. One is that if you use the, reuse the vignette, you should include the whole vignette in each question. Um, don't refer to the previous question because if the uh, test questions get out of order, um, it, uh, reversed anything, that is going to render your question um, useless. Um, second, um, sometimes vignettes are much more complicated than my vignette, clearly. They may have uh, lab information, they may have a list of medications and allergies that is relevant, and you want that information accessible to the student while they're answering the question so they don't have to be flipping back and forth between the former question and the current question. The reason that question in my previous slide might not be ideal is that if a student missed the first question about the lab test, they can't get the rest, the, the second question right. So don't write a series of questions where if a student misses the first question, which perhaps is a question assessing um, their ability to make the correct diagnosis, um, th then you have rendered that student, you, the rest of the questions become useless for assessing that student's knowledge. So you want to be sure that each question is independent, even if they are based on the same vignette. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a future um, presentation. I have a bunch of just odds and ends to talk about. As I said, um, if you are using drugs, um, use generic drugs. Trade name if you want, but always the generic. Um, avoid absolute words. So all or none, or always or never, um, can um, be cues to the students. Many and some, those quality words, are sometimes uh, confusing and make it much more difficult to sort out the best answer. So try to be very clear. It's important to avoid um, questions where you are in the negative. Which of these is not or all of the following are correct except? Sometimes these questions seem easy to write. Um, but they are less effective in assessing student knowledge. And they 
in, in the case of those questions, um, most of the time you wouldn't be able to answer the question without seeing the choices, right? Because it's the accept. And there might be a thousand accepts. You want to ask questions where um, the answer is clear. And as I said, when, when once you've read the question, if you know the material, you know the answer. And you look at the answers and you pick it. Um, if you kind of halfway remember the material, you look at the answers and you eliminate a couple. Um, and, are, and and that's fair. Um, but But... All of the above, none of the above, all of the following, except not, all of those sorts of questions are less effective at assessing uh, knowledge. Sometimes people put the correct answer and then they put the opposite of the correct answer as a distractor. And that provides a, a cue that helps the student eliminate incorrect answers without knowing the correct answer. Um, and then make sure that your uh, tenses and your um, amount, singular and plural words, are in agreement between your, your question and your answers, because sometimes inconsistencies provide cues, or if they are inconsistent, um, even worse is they, they cue an answer to be incorrect when it's not. Another odd and end that is helpful is that when your answers are numerical, they should be ordered, ordered. So they can be low to high or high to low, but don't jumble, jumble them up. And then keep numerical choices consistent. Have them all in the same format. So here are a couple examples. The, the first example is how you want it. You want numbers in numerical order here, low to high. The second one is a bad example where the passing grade on a MOOPAP exam, um, correct answer for this sometimes shifts, so I can't tell you what it is, um, but the answers should all look the same. They should be consistent. Just one or two other things. When you're writing test questions, proofread them. Make sure you've indicated the correct answer. Um, if you send us in questions that have uh, aren't keyed and they're in your specialty and they're complex, we may have some difficulty with them. So just make sure that you that, that you proofread that your spelling and grammar and punctuation are correct. Um, pay attention to the hints that you get in your apps, but recognize that not all medical words are in their dictionary, not all drug names are in their system or dictionary. And so if you're not sure, or if it's underlined in red, go look it up and make sure it's right. And then if it's underlined in red, that's okay. Um, I, I remember reviewing a test question where Jakob Kreutzfeldt uh, disease was spelled incorrectly um, and inconsistently incorrectly. And um, it just, it makes... Um, it's not a good look. It makes the program look bad. Um, but it's also just not helpful. We want our students to learn correctly. And last, I have a couple of resources that I have used to learn this little bit about exam item writing that I've passed on to you, but that you can learn. The National Board of Medical Examiners has a document. It's older, I think, but um, it's about five years now. It's several years old, but it has great information and you don't have to read the whole thing. It's a PDF. You can download it. You can print it. You don't have to have a login to their website or be a member, um, but reading the part about the specifics of item writing can give you some very good information. I believe they also have quite a bit of information in there about assessing uh, the effectiveness of your items. 
after uh, administering an exam, which is a little more advanced. That's something we will talk about. And then Brigham Young University Testing Services has a handbook. And again, this is older, but it's based on um, the knowledge that is still being applied in most exam writing. And it, it's a helpful way to for a new faculty member to learn a little bit about item writing, uh, exam question writing, and specifically multiple choice question writing. So I hope this was helpful.